estamos nuevamente en nuestro estudio en el libro Alejandro. May God bless every one of you. We begin once again in our study in the book to the Galatians, and we are going to begin today in the verse where we will continue from last week we got all the way to verse 7 and today we are going to begin in verse 8 galatians chapter 4 from 8 to 11 and it says but then indeed when you did not know god you served those which by nature are not gods but now after you have known god or rather are known by god How is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored in vain for you. The Apostle Paul puts the Galatians in the valley of decision. They should make a very personal decision. And it is to live under the laws or the elements of the, the laws, the elements of the law. And element, it's a principle, basic and, and very basic knowledge. I'll give you an example in the kitchen. All of the women who cook, even if we cook once in a while, before we sit to enjoy a delicious dinner first we begin with the elements to bring those ingredients together that are going to be integrated to obtain or to make a great meal so that's what element means it is the ingredients it is what will allow us to get a certain result now there's another word for it rudiment for the word element and it speaks in the original Greek of principles, beginning principles for the spiritual life or practices that are necessary for a spiritual growth. Now, we can say that these are the first steps and we all need those first steps. In the educational systems, It begins with a very simple knowledge so that the child will learn. They begin by learning how to read, by learning how to write, by learning how to add, mathematics, etc., etc. These are basic elements so that they will be able to learn the more advanced elements that come ahead. It is illogic to want to go to the university or to the college if you first have not had the basic knowledge in elementary school. That is what rudiment means, elements. And it is to arrive to a certain end. Now these elements have an ending when the truth of the gospel comes. And in other words, it is a primary stage that lacks a value when the child learns it okay once the child learned it they're going to continue they're going to move forward they're not going to continue in the same book in the elementary school they already understood that they passed that already and so now they are given a more higher knowledge and successively until they fulfill the purpose of getting a career. So if with this, hopefully it'll be more clear what the word rudiment or elements means. Now, the rudiments or elements of basic knowledges include disciplines and basic practices so that the person will begin to evolutionize, to comprehend, and from there comprehend the truth. Spiritual growth takes us to annul our self when we have grown and we have left the child of things we have left the things of children the basic elements and we have acquired a maturity a spiritual maturity so the first thing that we know is our self or our ego self 
This is so that our spiritual life will be continue to develop and advance in the spiritual things until we become to the stature of the perfect man who is our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need longer the conduct of basic elements, but we give our direction of our lives to the Spirit of God. And so what did Paul say? He says in verse 8, But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? The child was practically considered a slave because they were under a tutor. But in Christ we have been set free. How is it that the Galatians, after they had been enslaved under a tutor without any rights, without any legal rights or rights to an inheritance, how is it that now they want to become slaves again under the elements of this world that come under the law? And so it did not make sense. It did not make sense to Paul. Verse 8, we just read, and it says, But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. The most surprising, or the thing that most surprises Paul, is that they had already known God. In a, mo in a time they did not know God. They had false gods. But now, knowing God, and he explains to us, how is it that they go back to the slavery through those basic elements that after they had re rejoiced and enjoyed the Christian liberty, they desire to be slaves again. In other times, yes, they worshipped false gods. All of us, every single one of us has worshipped false gods before knowing God. The world is plagued with gods. From days of old, we can say, from the beginning, after the fall, the men began to worship what they saw or what they could make with their own hands. Now, in that time, they did not know God. We did not know God. But now, knowing God, they voluntarily put themselves under slavery. And this is what amazed Paul to the maximum. Verse 9, it says, But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? And it says here, after you have known God, but look at that part right after, or rather that are known by God. Because we can say, I know God, but does God know us? We say, well, God knows everything and he knows all. But it's not speaking about that knowledge. It's speaking about a relationship, a knowledge between a father and a son. I know a lot of people. I know of a lot of people, but I truly don't know them because I don't live with them. I don't have a relationship with them. And that is what this refers to. Now here, the apostle established something extremely important when he mentioned that it is not uh, that they know God, but rather that they are known by God. Why does he say this? Because the most important thing in our Christian life is that God will know us. This is the most, uh, what should matter to us the most. Let's remember the words of judgment that Jesus pronounced in Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 21. And it says the following, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And in verse 23 it says, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And what can we say of Matthew chapter 25, since we're already in the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, let's look at Matthew chapter 25 in verse 12, and it says the following, but he answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Now this case, just like the other one, 
the other ones did a lot of miracles. They had a lot of gifts. They were very privileged with the spiritual gifts. And they prophesied and they did miracles, but they did not have a personal relationship with the Lord. And when they did not have that closeness and God that knows it all, uh, he must have said, yes, I know of you, but I do not know you. There was no intimacy. There was no relationship, a personal relationship. And that is what this is referring to. And the virgins, it, this is the parable of the ten virgins that it's speaking of here. Now, these ten virgins are, virgins are waiting for the beloved. It was the bride. It was the church. And they were waiting. And all ten of them have lamps with oil. They had been baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they were waiting. And all ten of them watched. And all ten of them fell asleep. Now, what is the difference? The difference was in that they did not have an intimate relationship with their beloved, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Their oil was so scarce. They had very little that it was not sufficient to have an encounter with the Lord Jesus. Very limited, very scarce. And when they heard the voice of the Spirit that said, the groom is coming, the bridegroom is coming, they all prepared their lamps, but they did not have sufficient oil to prepare themselves and these five had to go buy oil but in the moment while they went to go buy there was no more time and the bridegroom arrived and when he arrived the ones that were prepared with sufficient oil because they had had a relationship of prayer of intimacy with the lord of submission of humility they had that personal relationship with him they were ready and they entered and the Wedding feast was celebrated and the door was closed and they came desperately knocking for the door to be opened and somebody peeked, somebody looked out and listened to the voice. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. That is why Paul says here, and it's good that they know God, but there's something better, something more important where it says in verse 9 in Galatians chapter 4, it says, but better to be known by God. It is more important. And it is good that we know God. But if we do not have that intimacy with God, we know of God, but we don't know God. And He neither knows us. Now, let's look at this. The Galatians is... How is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements? When they were turning back, the Galatians were not going back to a new error, but they were going back to an old error. The idea of a relationship with God by works, which is, that is what they were doing, they had begun with the Spirit and they were ending in the slavery of the works. It says, turn again to the weak and beggarly or poor elements. And in Galatians 3.3, 3, he mentions this. You began in the spirit and you are ending in the flesh. So they were going back. They were retroceding. The one who retrocedes or the one who, who retrocedes does not advance. Like the crab. The crab thinks they're going forward, but they're going backwards. Now with this, they chose to have a relationship with God through works. Legalism, for the one who lives by the works, lives by the appearances. And according to them, this gave them an appearance of spiritual maturity. But in reality, they turned to a second childhood. The law is to go back to a second childhood as a tutor because the tutor had the child but not the medium ones or the or the mature ones now the law cannot tend to the adult spiritual maturity delivers us from the tutor of the law of the slavery of not having legal rights in front of our father and much less an inheritance so beloved in christ look at verse 9 as paul says but now after you have known god or rather known by god how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage he's asking himself and he tells them now what they observe verse 10 you observe days 
even Saturday, and months, and seasons, and years. And look here that they went back to the works. Let's meditate on this. Let's meditate here. If we have been set free by Christ, could there be someone that from their will chooses to be a slave again? It doesn't make sense, right? It does not make sense. If this seemed surprising to Paul, I believe that it should seem or it should cause awe as well. They kept the dates or they observed the days. They observed Saturdays. They observed the months. In other words, the months, it was when they had the new moons. That is how they followed the times and the years, the stations or the seasons and the years. Now, the seasons and the years speaks about the great feasts. And some are perpetual statutes, like the Passover, or like the Feast of the Tabernacles, or the Feast of Pentecost, or the Sabbatic um, Feast, which they celebrated every seven years. Now, the weakness in these feasts, it's not that they were bad. The weakness in these feasts, it was that it made the days, in other words, the Saturdays, or the Sabbaths, or the years, or the seasons, they followed them as sacred, and that by fulfilling, they had fulfilled their duties towards God. I'm going to set a personal example. Something kind of like this, like when I used to go to the traditional church to go fulfill or comply with God. I would go on Sundays. I would go on the days to be observed. But then I lived however I wanted to live without any relationship with God. An hour, very devoted, but afterward, living in sin, following the current of this world. I think that with this, it is clear that is religion right there. That is legalism. I observed. I fulfilled my duty. But there is no relationship with God. The false teachers that are amongst the Galatians demanded for them to keep or observe all of this, making them believe that by doing all these things that they were going to be super spiritual men and women. This is what legalism does. And I underline this. Legalism pleases our carnality by putting our eyes in what we are able to accomplish for God and not in what the Lord Jesus did for us. Legalism gives me a certain prestige. It gives me a certain, uh, uh, I contribute my little grain. But the freedom that Jesus gives to us puts us in the status of sons and daughters and not just as sons and daughters but we are also possessors of a great inheritance that is why paul is saying these weak and beggarly elements you're changing the position of liberty with god and a rich abundant inheritance for this but the position of children and heirs will not adapt to our flesh because we did not do anything uh, well, in our flesh, we have to do something so that our flesh, so that my flesh feels that it contributed something. Because it all came from grace and not by the elements of the law. They believed that certain days would be classified as holy and would give something special to our lives. That is why so much, the Pharisees had so much contention with Jesus uh, when they told him, why don't you pick another day to heal? Now, why do you heal on Saturdays, having so many other days? Because um, Saturday, not the Lord, because the Lord is the Lord of the Saturday. It was more important to them, the Saturday, than the Lord of the Saturday. And so they said, we have to keep the day, we're holy today, because today is the day of observing, but tomorrow I could do whatever I want. Is that clear? That is what legalism takes us to. Now let's go to verse 11. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Paul laments himself that in thinking that he has labored 
and here it changes a little bit, but we're going to understand it. It's not speaking about a light work, but he's speaking about a working or a labor until exhaustion. But we don't want to get exhausted in the work of the Lord. We want it all relaxed. Now look at what Paul says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 or chapter 15, verse 10, so we can understand to see what Paul is speaking of when he's referring to the work, and it is not light work that he's referring to. Now, verse 10, he says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I. He is not exalting the works here. It says, But the grace of God which was with me. So since it was the grace that was in him, he was able to work until exhaustion. Do you realize how beautiful this is? Paul never thought that the gospel of grace meant laziness. He says that he has worked more than they all. He says, Yet not I. Legalism exalts the works that they do. Paul exalts the grace. And because of that grace, he has the power to work until exhaustion. And it is not him. He had worked more than all of them, but it was not him. Why? Because he didn't believe that the gospel of grace meant laziness. He says, I have worked more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So do you see the big difference between doing works to look good, to look uh, to look good in front of others that in the end it, it ends in exhaustion? Different from the grace that is given to us to work until exhaustion. But it is not I, but it is the grace of God which is with me. And it looks a little bit complicated, but it is not. If we pay attention to it, we can realize that it is not complicated. Therefore, they will have to say, like us, living in a relationship with God based on what Christ has done for us. This is what Paul expects from them to say. Or to the contrary, we can try to please God by our efforts trying to keep the rules, living like slaves and not like sons and daughters. So what Paul is expecting for them to have a relationship with their father, with our father, based. And that everything that we do is based on that relationship with our father, not in what we do, but in what he did for us to decide. Now, they have to decide between legalism or living in the gospel. Uh, now, as far as this, let's look at a good example in the life of John Wesley. He, This is a good example. Before he converted to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the son of a, of a clergyman. He was an orthodox in the faith, and he did the ministry in the jails, and he did um, in, in a poor neighborhoods, and he did underground um, ministry and he educated children in the poorest of neighborhoods. He observed Saturday and Sunday as a day of rest. And he arrived to England, and there he colonized, and he worked as a missionary in England. And he studied the Bible, and he prayed, and he fasted, and he gave his offerings with regularity. Now, look at this example. A very productive ministry, very, very productive ministry. Ministry in the jail, gave food, educated children as a missionary. He studied the Bible and he was a man of God, a man of God, which there is a lot to learn from. Nonetheless, notice, nonetheless, all the time he was bound to the chains of his own effort his religious effort because he trusted in what he was able to do to be right in front of God instead of trusting in what Jesus had done for him. And there's a lot of that. Furthermore or ahead, he 
trusted in Christ for salvation and he had that assurance inside his heart that he was forgiven and that he was a son of God. Now looking back to the religiousness, he said, before I was truly saved, he said this, I actually even had faith. He believed in God, but not the faith of a son. That's a big difference. We can do many things. We could even give up our lives in for the name of the Lord and not have a relationship as a son. Conscious that we are his sons and daughters and that what we do, we're going to see it further ahead because we can have a lot of religious activity and that's good that we have it to feed the hungry, to clothe the one who has no clothing, and to make missionary efforts, etc., etc. But if the motivation is to earn the favor of God and to this way have a relationship with God, we are mistaken. The intimate relationship is the one that we live in our Father's house and that intimacy. And when I say in our Father's house, I'm not referring to the temple. In our own home, we can come near. We can enter into the habitation of our Father, to that intimacy, to that place where we are alone with Him and have a relationship of a father uh, with a son of a son or a daughter towards our Father where we open our hearts and bring our pain and tell Him how we feel. Tell Him how I feel. In, at work, how I feel in the work that he has commended to me, how I feel when he sends me to do things that I feel that are not for me because my ego makes me feel that I deserve something better. To tell him how we feel, that we feel humiliated because we are not allowed to do what I feel like doing because I feel a passion. I've heard this so much. I feel zealousy for the cause of God and I should be already being a missionary, a preacher, a teacher. Be careful because Paul had that same zealousy and he was killing the Christians. Can we understand this? We can have a lot of zealousy and say, oh, I shouldn't be here sitting down. I should be, I'm called, I have talents, I have desires, I have passion. Yes. And Paul had it too. And he allowed for the first Christian, Stephen, to be martyred. He was like a bull with fire coming out of his nose as a dragon with a uh, with fire coming out of his nostrils. I can imagine him. He had letters with the approval of the officials to go to Damascus. And there, on his way to Damascus, the Lord made himself known to him because he had zealousy. He knew of God, but he did not know what the love of God was. So, beloved in Christ, I'm not impressed when one says, oh, I'm zealous. I'm zealous to learn. I'm zealous for this. Have zealousy for the love of God, for His grace. Yes, Lord, I want your grace. That we will cry, uh, cry out for that grace. And that grace is free. And it gives me no merit because the merit comes from Christ. Therefore, let's have this into account. Very present. Let's be conscious of it. So let's look at the other side now. So then I shouldn't do works then? Yes, you should, but not to earn the favor of God, but that the motivation of the works will be precisely the love to God, the love to our Father. And because of that love, I share my work in the Lord so that they will receive the blessing that I receive through the love of my Father. It's very different. There we see that it is completely opposite. The legalist works, those basic elements, those principles that no longer apply and they don't apply, but they were a base so that we would comprehend the truth of the gospel because the gospel is not in vain. Legalism is in vain, but not the gospel. Now, in the beginning, in these verses, Paul speaks that they worship gods that were false in verse 8. The, the false gods ask, 
to be offered sacrifices to supposedly be in a right relationship. So we have these roots in us of idolatry. Maybe you were not born in a evangelic crib and even being born in the gospel or in an evangelic home, you need salvation. You need the gospel. Some people say, I've never sinned because I was born in the gospel, but such person is a liar because we are all sinners. Because if we don't worship gods of gold, of uh, silver or wood, whatever it may be, but there is still a certain idolatrous tendency so that we can earn the merits in front of God, in front of men. And so that is in all humanity. These are the elements of this world. And so the false gods, all of us in a determined time worship these false gods. And now that we don't determine, now that we don't worship false gods, we want to set ourselves up as gods and we want to, you know, sit next to God to help him uh, because it's his grace is not sufficient for me. I have to do something for it. So beloved in Christ, all the false gods have always asked for something in exchange of earning a favor, even though they're false. The Babylonian gods asked for human sacrifices, and the Roman gods and all the gods, uh, the Baals, the gods of Israel, uh, Israel worshipped the Baals, and they worshipped the false gods, and they asked for their children to be put through the fire in exchange of giving them the the benefit of the rain and the fertility. And so the religious one, the legalist one, their gods asks things of them. And uh, we say such and such saint or such and such God, if you do this for me, I will offer this to you. So there's always that tendency of offering something up to these false gods. And the one who is subject to a false god is every day more and more slave to deceit and to lies. Now, God did not give us, didn't ask us for anything in exchange to put us in a relationship with him. He gave the sacrifice. He didn't ask. He gave. He offered. He himself gave up his son for the love toward us, and he gave him up to, to death and death on a cross so that we, through Christ, hallelujah, will have eternal life. And first, first, the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life, delivered from eternal condemnation, delivered from the law that enslaved us, delivered from our own selves, from our own sinful tendencies. Therefore, beloved in Christ, we through Christ, through Christ, we receive through Christ, receive the grace of God, the favor of God. So it was by grace, a favor that we did not deserve. It was not about what you and I were able to do to save ourselves, but by everything that he did to give us of his grace. Do you realize? And knowing the Galatians know this, and maybe many of us know this, we still want to do something in exchange of. We want to help God. And all we need is his grace. Even in sickness. Paul was sick one day. And the Lord didn't heal him. A thorn came to him. And he left with that thorn. And he asked God, he said, Lord, take this thorn from me. We don't know. There's been a lot of talk, a lot of thought. Uh, there's at least 10 theories of what this thorn could be. But we're not going to speak about the thorn. We're going to talk about his suffering. That he cried out to God. He said, Lord, take this thorn from me. He prayed. I prayed three times, he said, until the Lord said, my grace is sufficient because in your weakness, my power is perfected. And we don't want to feel weak. We want to feel strong. We want to feel important. We want to feel desired that they need us that we can contribute to give prestige to the work of God let it be sufficient your weakness in his grace 
because that is where the work of God is perfected in us through his grace. Can we understand this, beloved in Christ? The tendency of wanting to be great, the tendency of wanting to be seen and to believe that the more we do, well, greater merit we have with God. God is not impressed with that. Lord, in your name, I did miracles. Lord, in your name, in your name, I cast out devils. Lord, in your name, you heard how I preached. Lord, depart from me, doers of evil, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Oh, I go to the prayer vigils. I pray one day, once a month, and the rest of the days, like the days of keeping or of serving. Besides those, we live the way we want to live, unprevented, without filling our lamp, so that when the Lord comes, we will be filled of that spiritual oil. We want religion. Let's see what James tells us. Because there's always going to be that religious tendency. In the writings of James, James speaks to the church, you know. He's not speaking to the ones who don't know Christ. This letter was written to the church. This letter was written to you and me. James chapter 1, verse 27. And we're going to go to verse 27 to see if it's about religion. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, what is James telling us here? We want religion because we like religion. Jesus Christ is not religion. He's a relationship. But here we're going to find what the relationship with God is truly. It says, pure and undefiled religion before us is to visit the orphans and widows in their trouble, the people who could do nothing for us, first point, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. In other words, what you do, you do it in the eyes of God. And we will read verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God. In front of who? In front of God. And the Father is this, to visit orphans and the widows in their trouble. So you have to do these, the visiting, the most needy, to do the works. Who do we have to do it in front of? And this is if we want pure and undefiled religion. Before God, the Father, not in the eyes of the world to be recognized. There's a big difference there. False religion appears in front of others, a spirituality that does not exist through works. I've spoken to you about this before. I had a neighbor who used to tell me, you're going to go to heaven with your shoes and all, because I used to give her a ride to the market and she couldn't walk. And she believed in this thought of earning through works the way to heaven. So religion appears before others, a spirituality that does not exist through the works. And we're going to end with this, okay? We're going to go to Genesis. And here, we're going to see the beginning of religion. In Genesis, I told you that this deal of religiousness began since Genesis, which is to appear to do something. Chapter 3, verse 8, and it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Now let's go back to verse 7. He sees here that he's naked, but he believed that he wasn't naked. In verse 7, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So they believed that they could cover up their sin, their nakedness, covering themselves up with fig leaves. The fig leaves is religious works. 
I cover myself. I think that God's not seeing my bad works, my sin, that he's so happy with me because I do so many things that he doesn't see my sin. That's religion right there. Appearances. Therefore, James says, what we do, what you do, do it in front of God, before God. Don't do it so that people will clap for you or see you or tell you that you're going to go to heaven with your tennis shoes and all. Don't do it for that. Don't even do it for yourself to feel that you're so important, so um, valuable. Do it for the love of God. And in order to do it before God, we have to keep ourselves spotless before the world, covered in the justice of Christ, not naked. That is true religion. It is through a pure and clean relationship before God's eyes. And there's a little song out there that says, there's no religion who could change your being. Only the blood of Jesus can cleanse us. And another little song that says, only the power of God can change us. Only the power of God. And we are only accepted pleasing God through His grace, which is free, that was given through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, who saved us. May the Lord bless you abundantly. I hope we have understood the concept of what legalism is, religion, elements or rudiments, and what grace is, and that the grace of God will overabound over every single one of us. Give by grace that which you have received by grace. With the same grace that God has received us, well, let's love one another. It's not easy, but the more we ask of His grace, more than to be important, the more we're going to begin to love one another. May God bless you abundantly. I would love to tell you what I think of my Jesus since I found in him a friend so kind and true. I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other could ever do. No one else
was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery, oh, and so much woe. But Jesus placed his loving arms all around me. And he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no No one else could ever take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much. Oh, how much. 